Okay. Um, is everybody here programming Scala? Else, how, who's, who doesn't do Scala? How, how many people here have used uh, Scala Test or Specs 2? Everybody, almost everybody's used those. Yeah. So, you should really write tests. Uh, so, you know, I've been writing uh, Scala code for a long time and, and used both those libraries. I think I started on Scala Test, got frustrated, and switched over to Specs 2, and got frustrated, and so. I went off in a corner and said, you know, hey, we really ought to be able to do better. And so that was sort of the origin of, of uh, what I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, I'm not going to cover all that. There's probably not enough time tonight. The good news is, is all the material I'm not covering, there's good online documentation. You can go follow up and look at examples and documentation. So um, testing philosophy, I mean, this is sort of, sort of key to what was in mind. One of the things that bothered me about the existing test libraries, they were really big, uh, bloatware, huge, monstrous things, and they keep getting bigger all the time. I mean, how big does a testing library have to be? Um, and, I, and I think this applies a lot to large systems that we build. Instead of you know, building this system that's all things to all people, build yourself a small kernel, clean, nice concepts, and provide nice, clean extension mechanisms where you can customize it in any direction you want, because you never, uh, going to be able to, well, I suppose you could, you could provide every option people want. Scala test is trying to do that and it keeps getting bigger and bigger. Um, uh, a lot of testing I've seen out there, particularly in large companies, uh, managers view test as for them or for the project, uh, the, the, the project manager, program manager people. Uh, so they should be in English and you know they should be readable and they ought to be uh, tied into these people that aren't programmers. I say nonsense. I'm a software developer. Uh, I should be get the same kind of leverage out of testing I get out of writing code. And uh, I, I want a I want a tool for programmers, not for for managers. <clears throat> and and finally, it seems sort of odd where uh, in Scala, really the, the the great stuff going on is all about functional programming and immutable data. Yet the current testing systems are nothing like that. They really are classic. You know, you could have written them in Java. Uh, there's there's nothing there's nothing very functional or immutable about existing systems. So, um, can we do something in terms of addressing those issues? Here's some of the existing uh, Scala ones. Uh, I've still seen people use JUnit. I think uh, some of the Lightbin people told me they actually continue to use Light uh, JUnit. Until, that was fairly recently. And again, the two big ones, Scala Test and Specs two. I mean, I, I'm absolutely appalled. 400,000 lines of code for a testing library in, in Scala test. Specs 2 is a little better. Uh, there's a thing called MicroTest, which is sort of cute. It was um, designed by uh, somebody who was, was interested in the Scala JS uh, version and, and discovered they were having trouble porting Scala test. How many people here have used Scala check? Scala check is awesome. Uh, I mean, it's the one up on those. I'll come back and talk a little bit about it, but I think that's really. Uh, one of the things that we should be looking at more carefully. So, you know, I think this just repeats, I think, the things I said earlier. I'm looking for a small, clean, pure Scala, purely functional system. And uh, the, the system's around 1,000 lines as opposed to, you know, the previous numbers here, 400,000 lines. And it does, I think, everything those systems can do uh, in a lot less space. Oh, and it supports Scala check as a, as a component within it. So, um, you know, usual thing, it's a, uh, it's out on Maven Central. You can pull it down, uh, and all you need is an import statement. Then you can immediately start writing your test. So let me let me pull up a. Get, hello. Put some code up on the screen here, and this one. Is that big enough for everybody to see? Look good. So I'm just going to walk you through informally, and I'm going to come back in a minute and, and describe in more detail what's going on. But you, you shouldn't be terribly surprised. I've got a little, uh, the, the tests take the form of assertions. Is this assertion true, or are these two things equal? Um, assertions can be grouped into tests. So um, a test, a te the number of tests that, that, that work gets reported at the end. And there's also labels that can be used for higher level grouping. And uh, you know, you shouldn't find any of that terribly uh, low. What have I done? Oh, there it is. Uh, full screen. I'm in the, 
I'm in SBT here. Uh, I'm in an SBT prompt, but I'm just going to run that example I just showed you. You get a sort of a feel for for what it looks like. So you can see the first the the, the labels print out and the tests. And so I had one test with one assertion that worked, and one test with two assertions, one of which failed. And it reports there were two tests, one of which failed. Fairly fairly vanilla so far. Um, I want to come back and talk about what's really under the hood a little bit more. Um, and, and then we'll come back to that example and I'll explain it in terms of some of the data structures involved. So, where are we? Back here. Hello. Me, computer. Oh. Ooh, what's happened to me? Hello, there's the slides. There we go. Um, so concepts. Um, I assume everybody here understands the difference between imperative and functional programming. The focus here, you know, the, the, the existing libraries are all imperative. What happens is there's a some kind of big state data structure inside of things like uh, Scala test. And every time you execute one of those lines in the program, it makes some change in that mutable state associated with it. Uh, functionally, uh, there is no mutable state. What happens is there is an immutable data structure. And every time something occurs, um, rather than changing that, I create a new immutable thing, which is, which is derived by some functional transformation of the thing. So before an assertion, I have a value. After the assertion, I've got another immutable value, and that value has the original one, plus it captures whether that test succeeded. So, um, data structures. Um, the, the first data structure is a thing called lambda state. This is that state I was talking about. It, it's this immutable thing that captures all the information about a particular point during the computation. Uh, transformations are the next one. They take one state to another state. So. An assertion is a uh, transformation that takes a previous state to a new one. Uh, actions are nothing but sequences of transformations, and they compose in the obvious uh, sequential way. Uh, states have two subcategories within them. One is reporters. Reporters are ways of uh, keeping track of the results and the output of the tests. And there's also options, uh, options that control various uh, things that can be done slightly differently in, at, at various points in the computation. So, um, <clears throat> you know, classic kind of diagram here of, of a sequence of functional transformations. I guess the bottom one, you think about some initial state. Each test thing does some transformation. And if I was being a purely functional guy, I would hold off till the end and I'd take that state S5 and I'd produce some output based on that. Uh, I'm an impatient person. I don't want to wait till the end of the test to see the output. So I cheat a little bit here. And uh, most of the time, I actually incrementally output the results as the test runs. So that's, that's one slight modification on a purely functional thing. Although I could run it. I could run it in, the, uh, in that bottom model. I usually run it in the top model. Um, so there's a number of actions. Remember, actions are state transformations. We saw a couple of them. There's a, a cert assert EQ, EQ equality, which I showed you on the previous one. Um, assert EX is for testing whether an exception occurred. Assert SC is for Scala check assertions. So you can check things using the, the full set of Scala check capabilities. Uh, those are primitive actions. There's also compound actions. A compound action is something that contains other actions. If you remember, tests were a compound of assertions inside of them, and labels included other things. So these are the compound ones. We'll see some others as we go forward. Um, you know, that's just a picture showing a primitive action versus a, a compound action. Um, let's go back and look at that example again, if I can get it back. Um, okay. So, act here is, uh, I'll, I'll, so I need to extend lambda test, which came in from the, 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 the import up here. Act itself, it, you know, if you, I don't know if you can see this, it says that's a type lambda act. So that's going to be a, a, a transformation. 
and that's, the, that transformation is going to be uh, what gets run. In this case, I'll, I'll come back and explain this a little bit more in a minute, but I'm actually, I'm actually running these as a top-level app. If you, you notice in SVT, I was actually doing a run, uh, a run main against the test library, and so... Um, oh, and this run is a command that's coming from the Lambda test coming in the run. Uh, so what happened is each of these things is a transformation. The assert is a transformation. The uh, label here is a transformation. Uh, the test is a transformation. So each of those things are either one of those simple or compound things. So they're, they're basically is a very, very simple data structure. And it, it, I, 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 I lost my mind trying to work my way through Scala test and, and decrypt the number of different libraries and classes and traits there. It was just horrendous. Here, it, it, I've showed you basically all the main mechanism in the library. Uh, the only thing that I haven't explained is the plus operator here, uh, which is a composition of two actions to produce a new action. So, uh, in fix plus, I think. Any questions on this one here? It's pretty straightforward. It's almost embarrassingly simple, you know. Let's see, get out of here. Back to the slides. Is this object in the for every test? Is what? So the object that stands out is it in the for every test? Um, let me come back to that question. I, I got a section talking about running things, which is uh, is got more details, and I want to need to expand some things a little bit to talk about that. Um, I, I guess I can say I can run it. I can run it either w with that object, or I can um, I use the SBT test commands as well. And I don't need the object for those. That's the, sort of the short form of it. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk my way through some of these um, different features in the language. Each of them has an associated uh, piece of code with it, which you can go look at. Uh, Stop me if, if one of them particularly interests you. Otherwise, I'm going to just most, on most of them, I'm just going to talk my way through what the features are um, and might stop and look at code in some of them. Um, <coughs> so there is a, this assert EX, which is used to uh, assert that a particular piece of code is expected to have an exception. And there's some fancy things like you can look inside the exception to assert what kind of exception it was. Um, the system also um, has a lot of internal logic um, for um, unexpected uh, exceptions that occur. Uh, and so it'll capture those and do the appropriate thing. It tends to firewall them off at the test level. Um, mutable and immutable. Uh, the system itself is purely functional and immutable data structures. Of course, that doesn't mean I can't test conventional imperative code. And all, all this is saying is I can do code that also you know, has uh, variables and you know changes and, and they work just fine in the system as well even though the system itself is is immutable and functional. I'm going to skip that slide. Um, <clears throat> uh, of those of you who've used uh, Scala Test and Specs 2, have you seen before all and after all? I hate before all and after all. Um, as a functional programmer, let me tell you why, why I hate those, is because they are separate. If I need to communicate between the two of them, I have to put a global variable in. My God, for functional programming, you don't want to have a global variable. And so that was one of the, the things that, that drove me to uh, doing it. And so this introduces a purely functional immutable kind of wrapper mechanism. And um, this one's probably worth bringing up. I'll show you the code on that one. A little more advanced example. Up, 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 up. There it is. So here's that main object again, and here's the actual test. Um, and I've got an auxiliary definition I'll show you in a minute, but the idea here is this thing file wrap is a wrapper. This is another compound action. It's a little bit more sophisticated action. Uh, what ha is happening is it's going to open a particular file, and if we look at F here, which is injecting, F is going to be type Java buffered reader. So 
what's happening in the wrapper behind the thing is the file open is happening at the beginning and the file close is happening at the end. Matter of fact, it's not only happening at the end, it's happening even if there's an exception. The, the after all thing gets really screwed up if there's an exception in the middle. So, um, so I'm going to call f read line, f read line. I've got a little file here that's got one line that says foo and another that says bar. And then I run another test, same file. Again, this is going to open it again. So the first line zap is not going to be there. It's going to be this, the file is going to be actually foo. So that one's going to fail. So let's run that. Oops. And then I'm going to come back and show you the auxiliary code on that. Hang on. And you notice it, it, it does what I said. It, the, the first line was foo and the second line is bar. And then when I opened it for the second test, uh, it said, ah, I was looking for zap, but the actual line it found was foo. So let's, let me go back and show you the auxiliary code. This is one example of some extensibility in the system. We'll talk a little bit more about more generally downstream. But here is the, uh, here is the file wrap thing. There's that file name parameter. It's compound, and the compound, that f coming in, is going to be a buffered reader. And it's expected, if it's fed a buffered reader, to return one of these transformations, one of these actions. And the thing itself is an action. So this is exactly one of those compound things I'm talking about in the form of a wrapper. And there's a little boilerplate here. Uh, T is the. Uh, that's the state. Remember, a, a transform is a state goes to state. So that's the initial state. And uh, what happens here is basically there's this magic thing called a val that takes the um, um, lambda action thing and runs it in the, in the context of a wrapper. So that's a little more complicated, but not a lot. And uh, I'll come back and explain how this fits into the overall architecture a little later. This is a, one specific example. This is actually part of a more general pattern. I'm, of course, open to questions as I go forward. Um, back to the talk. Talk, talk, talk. There we go. I have questions. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I'm basically thinking in terms of the, uh, what is going on. Um, uh, like when you need to open databases and stuff, um, yeah. I'm blanking on what they're called, when, and then you need to do the test on them, so you need to reset the databases all the time. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of your method of... Yeah, this, this the database is another example. Another one, if you're Akka users, you've got to set up a, the Akka context at the beginning of the world. If you're Spark, there's Spark context. So there's a whole bunch of things that, that basically have this open something at the beginning, close it, and this wrapper pattern works just dandy for all of those. Yeah. Um, Skolacek. Uh, Skolacek is really awesome. If you, if you haven't seen it, it's basically property test, testing. And so what you say is, um, I'd like to describe a, a, a collection of, uh, non-procedurally describe a collection of different values that are going to go in my test system and use it to automatically generate all the tests. And uh, it really serves a a somewhat different thing. There's a, oh, there's a, my colleague from 47 Degrees, Noel Markham in London, if you haven't seen it, it's got this really nice set of slides on, uh, on uh, Skolacek. If you haven't seen it before, this is, I think, one of the better introductions. There's a bunch of stuff out there on it. But <clears throat> you basically, you've got this set of values, and I can say for all, uh, for all these things, this property is expected to occur or exist, there's going to be some value for which this property holds. So, the thing to do is let's go look at some actual code. I think it makes it a little more concrete if you haven't seen it before. Also, we'll see how it fits into this system. And uh, let's call check. It's a little bigger. So 
here's your, here's your basic assertion. This assert SC, this is a, a lambda test thing. Inside its body is, uh, is Scala check code. So that's actually Scala check code. And this says, this is sort of the classic example. If I, if I concatenate A with B, uh, it's going to start with A. Um, and uh, I didn't specify the data set. Uh, Scala check has a set of defaults. I, it's, it's a, I think it's a couple hundred or something. It runs by default. We'll see when we run it. Um, this is one that's going to fail. If, uh, if, a, if I concatenate two things, it's going to be greater than the A length, and it's going to be greater than the B length. That obviously fails if A or B is the empty string. So we'll see that. Uh, there's going to be some test data for which that fails. And uh, down here, uh, we see another thing where I'm specifying actually the data set I want to run it from a choose. Again, this, all the stuff inside the assert SC um, is, uh, is Scala check code. Oh, and Scala, uh, and Scala check has some parameters, so let's see if I can slide that over just a little bit. So you can set the various parameters in here as well if you've seen Scala check before. So um, integrates very nicely. I think it, you know, I mean, they, they really serve complementary roles. So let's run that just to see what it looks like. And that was Scala check. So you'll see the first one, um, I, the fall pairs of 100 tests. It ran all 100 tests and succeeded. The, the first one failed immediately when it tried the empty string. So I mean, it was often, oftentimes it's not the first one, some something way down in the world. And uh, so it automatically do shrinking. It what? Shrinking. So in Scala check, there's shrinking. Right? Yeah, yeah, that, that's all there. All the, all the, all the, all the stuff about. Uh, all the, all the clever logist, uh, log, logistical things inside of Scala. This is Scala check, okay? Um, uh, just a little side note. One of the things I don't like about libraries is when you pull a library in and it pulls 10,000 other jar files in. Scala check does that. This library has basically one dependency. Scala check <laughs> is the only de real dependency in terms of external things in this library. I felt that one was really, really one. Everybody ought to use Scala check. So, over here. Options. There's a bunch of different options that you can set. And again, because options are part of the state, I can change the options as I go forward. More interestingly, if I have a compound, remember the compound, so I've got a set of options coming in, I can inject a different set of options down into its children and then go back to the original is a very common thing. So if I have a particular set of tests I want to turn on slightly different options for, I can do that. Um, and tags. Um, most of these libraries have tags. Um, you know, you talk about um, unit tests and integration tests or tests to run on Tuesdays or tests I want to run before release. And so the system has a, has a set of tagging mechanisms that control which ones get run. And it's very much like everything else. It turns out the tags are actually managed by include, exclude sets, which are part of the options data structure in terms of setting it. So you, you have the usual ability to set tags up. And again, there's some sample code running. Um, it, Remember I said there's two ways of running it. One is directly, and the other is via SBT. It turns out SBT has this uh, rather arcane API for attaching a test code. I believe it was uh, done by our, our friends in Scala test land. And so this system also implements that. But if I'm reporting via SBT, I've got to use a different output mechanism than if I just run it directly what it just writes to standard out. So there actually are two different built-in reporters. And if I'm running it with SBT, it uses a special SBT, the one that talks to the SBT API for integration. 
Um, reporters. And I talked about deferring or not deferring things. Um, there is a, um, there's one that holds it. And um, the reason for holding it, um, there, there's two different modes, and I, I don't know if I talked about them, but I'll, I'll mention the two just because they're interesting features as well. One is the system supports, I can explicitly ask the children of a particular compound action to be run in parallel. So what happens is it actually um, uses uh, a Scala futures, and so it'll, it'll run each of those child, children. Now, if I, if I just run it the standard out, the output from all those children is going to get intermixed, so what happens is the behavior is it outputs the first one immediately and then waits for all the others to complete and then outputs them all in the order that they were written originally. So it uses that hold reporter to, to, to temporarily. And so that information gets stored in the state, uh, the reporter state, which again is part of the overall testing state. Um, the other one uh, is an interesting one. I don't know if you guys have ever run really huge sets of tests and um, you know, they're, they're regression tests for a really big system, and you get page after page after page of output, and I have to look for, was there a failing test, which was on page 23 or something. There's this cool option called only a fail, and it only outputs the failing things, but it's part of the test, so it actually runs the entire test to see if there were any failures, and if there were failures, it outputs that whole test block. And so it uses the hold reporter until that test is done, and then it decides whether to output it at that point. So that's how that's being used. Uh, I mentioned parallel execution. Uh, and I think I said everything there. Um, extending. This is one of the key things, is can you take a core library and really extend it into radically different domains? Uh, you know, I got this very simple a uh, thousand lines of functional immutable Scala code. Can I do some really fancy things with extending on that on that API? And I've written, oops, ah, let me come back where I'm going. Uh, there's two different ways I can do it. One is a programmable directly in place. The uh, the wrapper that file open and close file wrapper was an example of programmability in place. The other is I can actually build a whole new library uh, if it's something that gets used. And I, there's a couple of libraries. So um, let's look at generate. Generate, I, I'm trying to get the idea that, that tests are not assert one, assert two, assert 500, assert 700. You know, this big, long, flat thing. It's a programmable thing. We're programmers, and we really ought to be able to program our tests. So let's look at this generate one. It's a little bit trivial, but it sort of hopefully gives you the flavor of what I have in mind in terms of, of generation. So go here, go there, go to generate. Again, it's a little bit of a hokey example, but you get the idea. So I just defined uh, an immutable list up here for sense for sake of this example. And then uh, what I'm going to do, ah, real programming, zip with index. So I'm going to take that zip with index and then a test and an assertion. And there's a label and there's a zip with index in the middle here. It all works out just fine the type, as long as the types match up to the appropriate state and action types. And what I'm going to assert here is the value of each element is equal to its index in the, in the thing. So if you look up here, the first and the last element are going to satisfy the test. The others are going to fail. Um, and here's a, this is sort of poor man Scala check down here on the bottom. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to generate a random number uh, 10 times and assert it's even. Uh, that's obviously not repeatable, observe, as well. So let's run that. You need to see what the output looks like. And this one's called generate. Okay, so you see um, zero worked, one failed, two failed, three failed. If I, if I turned on the only a fail mode, 
what would have happened is these, the first and the last one would have vanished in the output. So that, that's what that option would have done. I didn't turn it on here. And uh, you'll notice here it found some, uh, some things. If I run it again, uh, I'm going to probably see a different set of numbers there on the output. So yeah, you see I got a different set of outputs from the random number generator. But the idea basically is um, testing is not this domain in and of itself where you can't juggle anything. It's just another kind of programming and another set of data types that you can integrate. Uh, you know, I, I think particularly in my mind, if I'm building a, if I'm building a large system um, with unique properties, oftentimes I'm going to want to build a sort of test jig for, just for that system that's got, that, that recognizes some of the interesting properties of what I'm testing in the system. So I'll define my own custom testing library in the system and then have those custom tests tailored to the particular project I'm on. If I'm just writing a little piece of code, probably I just use the stuff that's built in. But if I have a big project and I have a lot of customization I want to do, uh, being able to build those is probably a, a good thing. Question? Question. So you, you're pretty much getting in there. Is that custom assert? Let's go back and look at let's let's look at the code again for a second. One of the things Hang that on. I found um, frustrating about Scala tests is printing out. You, they, you, have, they have built-in asserts that have useful, useful stuff. But if you write your own, thing, it's a pain in the ass. Well, you'll, you'll see. You'll, the two, first first comment is you'll notice it's it's a it's a an interpolated string here. It was uh, it, right here. Is where that line came oh, from. So you just put, uh, on the other hand. <clears throat> the more general question is sometimes I want an assertion that isn't like either of these, either the assert or the assert EQ. It's trivial to program those as well. That would be, a, I think the assert and the assert EQ are ones that you see all over the place. And so those are sort of the standard ones that come out of the box. But you can build custom ones uh, to your heart's content as well. Answer your question? Okay. Um, Um, here's sort of a, a little bit more of a picture of the architecture. There really are three layers. There is the core part of the system here that's got the state and the actions. Uh, and there's all the really heavy duty, uh, difficult to write stuff here. So it handles parallelism and the reporters and all kinds of other weird stuff. There is, down here is the user code I write. And so this is the typical user. There's this intermediate layer which are things like the assertions and the wrappers and things, uh, some of which are built in. But I was just telling, I was just mentioning the fact that if I wanted a custom assertion, what I would do is I'd build it here. There is a lower level APIs here. Well, we saw a Val. Remember, a Val was in the wrapper code. If you remember back there, there was this magic of Val that, that knows how to run. It knows how to execute a Lambda act to do the transform. And there's a whole bunch of primitives for the state. So this is the stuff that lets me put more surface stuff on it and tailor it. There's actually a lot of freedom there. And so there's a set of ones that are built in just because in my mind at least they were the ones that were sort of the more obvious ones I want to use day to day in common tests. But it's easy to build new ones. So with that said, um, I think that just said, I think I just said all that. Um, I'm talking about more information. And uh, we can, I think we're running good on time. I can come back and we can go back to earlier examples if you want. So think about what you might like to talk about. Let me just do this here real fast. Um, there are extensions. These are three extensions I've written. These are all, all also open source projects out there. Uh, the first one's a timing library. It, uh, you can time how long it takes to run a piece of code. Or you can run that piece of code multiple times and get the, the, the mean and standard deviation on timings and things like that. So it's a... You know, if you need to do timings, it just, you pull that library in and it just fits in as a new set of, of assertion time things. That, uh, there's also the ability to write a test that says this piece of code has to satisfy this particular timing constraint. So if you've got a time critical code, you could write an assertion saying this code has to run that fast. Yes? Just a quick question on the timing. Uh, uh, we've uh, used uh, Scalameter in the past. It does a bit of warm up before it does the timing. Yes. Is this just the same? There is an option for warm up on this as well, yes. Uh, I, 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 one, of, one of the libraries I've written um, earlier in this was a, a JSON library. And 
I, we, did, we did incredible amounts of extensive timing testing on this JSON library and a whole bunch of other Scala JSON libraries. And uh, it's a bear trying to get repeatable test results on a JVM. <laughs> the warm-up helps, but it's, it's, it's definitely not sufficient. Uh, I think it was a real black art in terms of, yeah, again, warm-ups are good, but if you're really serious about timing, it's, it's, it's a hard problem. This, this gives you at least the, the simple form. Um, the second one is, could I do something with actors? There's a, there is a, an actor test kit that comes as part of Akka that, I, that I've never been terribly fond of. And so I built my own custom extension to Lambda test here that can be used for testing actors. So in effect, you know, you can, you can, you can, you can send messages in and have expected messages. It's obviously asynchronous. So, uh, you know, you send a message and then there's going to be some period of delay and you can set timeouts and things on those as well. So you know you can you can basically uh, do unit tests on um, on actors. Uh, the other one is it is it all the output I showed you for so far goes sort of to standard out. Um, I thought it would be interesting if I wanted to build this as part of a more automated system. Maybe I want to capture the output of the test in machine readable form. And so what I did is I built another um, uh, writer instead of a standard out one. It captures the data and all the output that was standard out uh, goes into a, a JSON file that's, that you can then parse very nicely and, and take a look at the output uh, with post-processing code. So uh, those are just examples. Those three that I, th I thought were cool to write, but it's easy to write these. I guess the, the, uh, the, the ACA one was, was sort of non-trivial, but just because ACA is non-trivial, the other, other two were relatively simple to write. And the ACA one was non-trivial not because of Lambda test, but because of the complexity of using using Akka. How many people here have used Akka? Most, most of you guys, okay. Um, I think it's really important, I think a really sad trend in the industry today is the lack of documentation or the crappiness of what gets produced. And I, I really, I, I really, I really, you know, as a developer think it's, it's really bad. One of the advantages of this kind of a system being small is the documentation tends to be small. Think about documenting uh, um, Scala test, 600,000 lines. I mean, they've got to have huge documentation, keep it up to date. Uh, so there's a, there's a bunch of documentation. I'll go, I'll go up and show you some of that in a minute. But there's, a, there's, a set of, there's an online user's manual. There's ScalaDoc for all the APIs. Uh, I showed you some of the sample code. I tried to write short samples of, of most of the major features. Um, I've written a number of blog posts on the 47 Degrees blog, and plus there's the extensions I talked about. So, let's see, where am I on the slides? Yeah, let's, uh, let's take a break, and I'm just going to, oops. I'm going to go show you the, the GitHub. Okay, so here's the GitHub site, and... Uh, most of the documentation is off in other places, so um, the Scala doc and sample code are obvious. Um, are these sort of nice little? Oh, quick. There we go. Um, so here's this. This is a, a little blog post that talks. This is a sort of a repeat of some of the philosophy discussion I gave you earlier in a blog post that talks about the philosophy of building systems this way. So that's an example. Um, also, it uses this um, 47 degrees. It's got this really cool documentation tool, um, and this is what it looks like. So, you got a nav bar here, and uh, you know we can go through. So, no comparison. There's more detailed information on the different how the different libraries compare, for example, and. Uh, there's a quick start. Uh, concepts, we talked about concepts a little bit. Actions. So these are the built-in actions that we, we saw. A number of those, we didn't see all of them. There's like one to change options. Um, information on how to run it. Um, oh, and of, of course, you know, it's an open source project. Uh, Anybody's willing is, uh, is certain, I'm, I'm certainly willing to take um, contributions with one rule. The one rule is 
I intentionally made this library small. If you can't argue that you can't do it with an extension, <laughs> I don't want to put it in the core. I think it's a very different philosophy than a lot of systems where, you know, again, we, we're getting this bloatware dumping of everybody's crazy ideas in open source project. I think it's a really bad trend and, you know, this is a little piece of sanity in a, in a world that uh, doesn't necessarily support that point of view. So. Anyway, you get the idea. And of course, there's the usual. I to drill myself down to the library. So, okay, here's Lambda State. That's that internal API. Um, I, uh, I mentioned that you build, this is the lower layer that things like assertions and stuff are built on top of. So these are the, uh, some of the, the, the internal APIs, if you want to add extensions, you'd, you'd work in terms of these APIs. So they all tend to be fairly, fairly thoroughly docked. And of course the code's all there as well. It is an open source project with everything you need. Go back to slides. Um, a couple other things I wanted to mention. I've done a, I've done a number of different open source projects. Uh, I just thought I'd mention them in passing here if you want to go look at them. Um, the the world I, this this was one I did a few years ago it was a really fast JSON parser. It is not functional, and uh, there's been a number of great JSON libraries appear since. Now I happen to like this library because it's mine, but you know I, it, uh, it 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 doesn't stand out as much as it did. Um, I hate the logging support in Scala. Everybody uses the Java loggers, which are absolutely hideous. Um, this is a um, new logging library, which I think is actually pretty good. It's pure Scala, no Java code. Uh, and it supports um, integration with, uh, it's got its own logging API. Uh, it's, it integrates with the Aka logger. It integrates with all the old Java code, so it, uh, and it's clean. It itself is built using an Aka actor in the middle. So if you're building systems with logging, that's a definitely one worth doing. Um, you may know about physical units. Just go over there for a second if I can. It introduces type checking, a little bigger. Where you actually statically type check your physical units, meters, centimeters. A uh, number of people built libraries. I actually, actually, I think I actually did, many years ago, I actually did one of the first specs on this, uh, the first implementations of this kind of library way, way pre-Scala. So I felt I had to do it in Scala, but again, there's, there's a number of other people who've done libraries out there. It's, it's sort of cool, you know, if you're working in those kind of physical units, I think, you know, if I was in that, I don't do stuff in that space, but the example's sort of cool from a, development point of view. And I did this other thing which uh, uh, was sort of interesting. I, how many, how many people, you got, we got Spark people here? You know, you know data sets, they had data frames which were sort of SQL-ish and they introduced data sets in an attempt to get more static type checking. And it turns out, if you look at them, they actually don't fully statically type check. Uh, and there, there, there's some interesting deep reasons for this. As it turns out, there are significant weaknesses in the Scala type system. Odersky is in the middle of hopefully doing a Dottie, this new version of Scala, which is going to hopefully fix some of it. I, I'm not entirely convinced. But so I wanted to say, could I actually build a library that was fully statically type checked? You want to check two things. You want to check the types are correct. The other thing is, if I've got fields, uh, Spark, you know, I've got, you know, a, B, and C subfields of a, of, a, of a case class, it doesn't check the existence of the fields, it checks them at, at, at execution time. So I built this library to do it, and it was an interesting experiment because I used Scala macros. Um, I learned far more about Scala macros than I ever want. I'm, I'm pleased to hear that Scala macros are now deprecated and going away forever. Uh, what a horrible, terrible design. So the, the biggest thing I learned out of that is um, if you can all avoid it, uh, don't use them. Um, the, the best way to use them is th there are a number of libraries that um, are built on macros 
that present a, a friendlier view of the world. Shapeless is, is one that, that probably comes most immediately to mind. Uh, don't, un, unless, you're, unless you're a total masochist, don't, don't ever try writing anything with macros. So anyway. Uh, and Just on that, so what do you think about the new Scalamina stuff? I have not looked extensively. I think, you know, what I've seen of it is it's looking much cleaner than the, the macro stuff. I, uh, it's always tough when you just read the documentation, which is all I've done on it, to really get a feel. I mean, one of the reasons I did this project is I really wanted to, to kick the tires on macros. You learn a lot by actually writing code, and I haven't written any code with Scala Meta, so I think that's the sort of test in my mind to really understand it deeply. You've got to write code, and I haven't done it yet. Um, uh, this, uh, the work on Scala test was actually done at 47 degrees. There's some little stickers over there. Uh, I'm no longer with them, although they're my friends. And I, I, since they supported this project, I wanted to give them a little plug. Um, they're, uh, they're an international company, headquartered in Seattle, where I'm at. They have an office in London. They got a large development team in Spain, which is sort of cool, in Cadiz. Um, they've got a ton of open source projects. You saw the the Scala chest checks the the Scala. Um, you might say the the Scala examples uh, is they they got a huge number of projects. They oh Scala exercise that's what I'm trying to say. Scala exercises, as well as a bunch of other open source. It, it's really a cool company because the people there have really been major contributors to a lot of open source projects. They've really been active in the community, so they've got some cool stuff out there. Uh, they partner with all the usual culprits. Uh, more interestingly, they're a member of the advisory board of the, of the Scala Center, so they actually are very influential. They actually built, um, uh, not so with a lot of recognition, they built a lot of the software for the, for the Scala Center, actually. So if you ever go to the Scala Center website and stuff, the 47 Degrees guys actually built it. So anyway, I wanted to give them a little plug since they're my friends and since they helped support the project. Anyway, I think that is, we're, and we're good, we're just about right on target on time, so... I'll take questions. Is there a plugin for mocking libraries already produced by someone? Is there a plugin for mocking anything? Like Makito, Scala. I don't. I don't know. You know, the Scala Center's got this great. Let me back up here. Pull the website up. If you haven't seen it. Um, nope, 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 the right button. In just a second. Ah, here. The uh, badge. The right badge. The Scala Dex. Have you guys seen Scala Dex? This is something out of the Scala Center, and it's a uh, index of lots of open source projects. This is the page for mine. But if you, were, if I was looking for mocking libraries, just Try the experiment real quick. There's an Akka mock, HTTP mock. So anyway, there's a bunch of libraries. I don't I don't know very much about them, but uh, yeah, there's you know there's there are some mocking things out there, as well as I think you can you can probably use some of the Java mocking library. I wouldn't be surprised yes, if people so using like Makito and stuff like that in yes, Scala. So the question was, is there a plugin for Lambda tests? That supports any of those. Would you would you like to write an extension for that? Uh, yeah, but well, that would probably you know, you know meet my adoption of lambda test. Yes. Uh, uh, again, it's open to the world. Uh, the other comment is, uh, I yeah, I, I have strong opinions, and one of them is I personally think mocking is a terrible idea. So that's probably why I, I'm not going to build a library myself. But I have, no op I have no objections to other people doing stuff with mocking. That's probably another half hour discussion about why I don't like mocking. But uh, sure. you need it in purely functional code. Yeah. 
you shouldn't you shouldn't need it as much in purely functional code. Although there are things like databases and things that you you know we need in building real systems. There's a potentially a need for for mocking data structures in those as well. Um, <coughs> You know, uh, dependency injection, I don't like using external frameworks. I like just using traits and things inside of Scala and actually build if I need to do that. And again, I, I try to minimize it. I try to do those uh, entirely inside the Scala language. I think using things like juice and some of the other ones on the outside is just, you know, you, you can do it in Scala. You should stay there. Yeah? What's your thought about free monads? About? Free monads. Free monads. Oh, God, everybody. Uh, there is there is so much incredible stuff um, going on. There's a uh, there's an interesting project 47 degrees is doing called Freestyle, which uh, if you haven't seen it, it's worth checking out. There's a, the big community of people participating around uh, you know free mon basically free mon ads and some of the stuff around that. Um, my my reaction is is twofold. One is um, the, the use of terminology and I know it and you don't know it attitude has really been a discouragement to adoption in the community and I, th I think that's been unfortunate in scaring like Java programmers and other people away from, from picking Scala up. On the other hand, for, forget the terminology and, and look at the idea of monads and the composition and the abstraction stuff there. There's phenomenally great stuff going on in functional programming and so I'm a big fan. I just, I'm just concerned. Uh, uh, as a you know, as a practicing engineer and, and somebody who teaches, uh, I'm I'm always concerned about how do you bring more people into the community. So I mean, I went off on it. I've, I've been doing I'm doing a lot of teaching, uh, and the goal of the, my, one of the goals of teaching is I wanted to enlarge. I mean, it wasn't because I wanted to teach. It was because I wanted to enlarge the scholar community. And so, how do you bring more people in? And how do you, you know? So there was a, like like I've I've been teaching at the University of Washington. We do like a whole three hour lecture on. Monads for for people who've never seen monads before, and how do you start doing it in in, in a scholar context? But yeah, it's good stuff. Uh, what about the use in your program? Like uh, what I heard that they say all the names are free monads, but it's an abstraction, so a lot of runtime times goes uh, runtime times it takes for whatever things you want to do. So the 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 distinction between isn't this beautiful, mathematical, elegant, and, and does it run poorly? <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, it's an issue. Uh, I, 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 I love the purity. On the other hand, you know, I'm a, I, I tend to be a practical engineer, so when I'm, if I'm, if I'm you know, working on systems, real systems, I tend to shy a little bit away from it. Some of it's the performance concern, and some of it is in most companies, I'm a little bit concerned I can't necessarily get everybody on the team fully up to speed. And so if there's really a compelling reason for a particular set of functional abstractions, I think I think go for it. Or if you have a company, there are some companies that you know hire nothing but really top end uh, functional programmers. And, and that's cool if you're doing that. But if you've got your typical company, you, you may have some people that know some Scala, some of which may even be good functional programmers. But across the board, the team can write Scala code. They aren't necessarily uh, have their heads fully around all the functional stuff. And so I thought it'll change over time, but at least right now, at least what I see in, in, in Seattle where I'm at, um, the, the people still aren't ready to go full bore in most companies into, into that. And again, the performance scares managers for sure. Um, and, uh, you know, I've, on, on the cases where I've done it, um, sometimes it's very hard a priori to predict performance effect given a lot of the optimizations that go on. So if I'm going to do it and it's a really serious project, I tend to, I tend to do small uh, test examples uh, both ways and then time them out and, you know, and see if the overhead is, is within, you know, if the benefit of going to the better abstraction is justified in maybe some slight penalty in, in overhead, so. Yeah. So basically uh, there's a library for uh, property-based spark testing, uh, which I once again forgotten. Uh, does does basically uh, lambda test also uh, have uh, integrations that way? For Spark, did yeah, you? For Spark, so I can do property-based testing for in, in a Spark context. 
I uh, hadn't thought about it. Well, well Scala, Scala Check would work on Spark, right? There's no reason why Scala Check wouldn't work yes, on Spark. but when I, I did it a while back, like six months back, uh, I, I had to hack something. It was a different library that I had to actually get working with, uh, uh, with a Scala Check in order to get it to work on Spark and generate like the, uh, the, the test uh, data frames or so there, they, I, I haven't looked recently, but there there were some uh, version incompatibilities on the, the, there were there were some pro, there were some problems in some of the Spark libraries. Compatibility with certain Scala libraries has been a problem. Um, and uh, again, I haven't been actively doing any Spark work for the for the last six months, so I'm a little a little out of out of. But yeah, I, I don't see any reason why this wouldn't work. And again, I mentioned the wrapper technique as you know, and, and setting up things like SQL context and stuff like that would be a natural thing. And I, I would think, I mean, I, I hadn't thought about it until you asked the question now. My, my first reaction, without thinking very hard, is the, 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 the Scala check stuff should work in, uh, in, in for Spark testing as well. Uh, if I thought about it and tried it, I might find something I, I hadn't thought about. But initial reactions, it should work. Yeah. You mentioned how you are not a big fan of AdCap test kits. What's, what's your thoughts on it? It it feels a little clunky to me, a little overly complicated and a little bit clunky. I guess was, um, and uh, I actually had a long online discussion with Jonas when I was working on the on the Aka extensions here about how to do things, and I think he and I. I, I, I have tremendous respect for Jonas. He's a, he's a phenomenal guy. But he and I had some slightly different philosophy, and I, I, I'm not sure off the top of my head I can remember the, the main points on it. But if you, um, uh, it, Akatest is not that big in, in this library. Uh, from, a, from, a, from a user point of view, it's not that big. You can go look at both of them and, and judge for yourself. I don't think it would take a huge amount of time to look at them both and compare them. Everybody tired? Okay. Okay, hey, thanks everybody for coming tonight. It's been fun. Yep.